so let's talk through every one of Games Workshop's box sets for 40k's favourite race of robot skeletons. Hello and welcome back to Warspets Tactics, where today we're talking Necrons, and we're going to be going quickly through every single kit that Games Workshop sells for the faction, talking through some of the positives and negatives of each box set, including options available, how good they are in-game, and how many points you get per dollar invested. Just in general, I think that the Necrons range is in a really good place at the moment. They of course received a massive update from the 9th edition launch sets that updated a massive amount of iconic kits, as well as adding a huge amount of extra squads and Canoptech war machines to the faction. We'll go through each box in turn, talking through the Force organisation chart, then go through a few of their bundle kits for Necrons, and finish up with a quick look at some Forge World stuff. Lots to talk about, so let's jump in and talk about some living metal and Canoptech constructs made plastic. So first up we have the Necron Warriors, £30, $50 or €40 Euros for 10 of them, plus 3 Scarab Swarms, there's 175 points worth of models in the box, not a bad ratio in terms of points per dollar, and in game they're currently okay, though a fair few stronger Necron lists aren't taking an enormous amount of troops right now. I think for a standard box of faction troops for 40 k it's not too bad, fairly nice quality plastic models, the option of a swapped gun between the Gauss Flare or the Gauss Reaper, Head swap options to allow the squad to have a bit more of a damaged or badly repaired look. And I think having a few Scarab Swarms in there is pretty fun. You do get basically a troops and a fast attack slot in the same box. All that being said though, at least at the moment it doesn't make sense to really ever buy a Necron Warrior box. If you are going to, you may as well get the Recruit starter set for 40k. That's only a minimal amount more than the Necron Warriors. In some places around the world it's less. And that comes with a Royal Warden and 6 Space Marines as well. So I basically never get this while that's available. You can also get Necron Warriors in this paint set as well, £22.50, $35 or €30, Euros. obviously isn't really going to get you much interesting in terms of points per dollar, though in theory it does give you a small saving compared with buying these paints and this brush and the Warriors separately if you estimate the value of the Warriors based on the kit. In general I think if you just want to dip a toe in the army or 40k in general it's not bad, a bit of a taster set of 40k models plus some paint to put on them. So I think it's aimed at people who just want to test the faction out and don't have any paint supplies to start with. I feel like you probably will get better value out of just getting the recruit set and actually getting the paints that you want though, rather than being locked to these ones. It would cost you a bit more than twice as much as this, but you would get massively more models for your investment. Still though, not a terrible option to have for people who want to try out 40k. Otherwise in the troop slot, there's the box of immortals, which can also be built as death marks. You only get 5 models in the squad here, £26, $42 or €34, Euros, a fair bit lower in how many points you get on the board, though in game quite a lot of Necron players seem to be running minimum size immortal squads to fill out their troop section. I think they do the job well of looking like slightly raised and more elite Necron warriors. You get the option of Tesla carbines or Gauss blasters here, some really quite big fun guns for the models. The kit can also be built as the death marks as you can see here. They get the heads with a single focused eye, which I imagine perhaps doesn't work amazingly for depth perception, and carry these rather cool looking synaptic disintegrator rifles. I say that death marks maybe aren't quite as competitively relevant as immortals right now, and I would bear in mind that both kits can be obtained in the combat patrol box, you get two sets of immortals slash death marks, that does seem a pretty reasonable way to get some squads of them, plus some other things at a bit of a discount. Elites next, and we'll start out with flayed ones, £32.50, $55 or €42.50. This gets you 5 Necron Warrior size models for just 50 points in game, and have perhaps one of the most laughable points per dollar ratios in 40k, you get less than 1 point per dollar invested in this kit, which really is saying something. I really think that they could have made a 10 model kit for these guys, particularly as you often want to run them in fairly big rack and top hordes, or Games Workshop could have just charged a little bit less for them. I'll admit that the sculpts do look pretty nice, they're very creepy with their draped skins all over them, though they aren't exactly the most advanced kit ever, they don't really have options, just the slicey claws that you can see here. Anecdotally, I have heard quite a lot of people just converting them from Necron Warriors, which of course are very cheap and readily available in discount bundles, so with the addition of a few extra blades and things, you could get some flayed ones significantly cheaper than this. In game, they're really not too bad though other cheap little nuisance units that could drop down and do actions or go for objectives, or potentially a big ranked up blob that's really quite tough for the cost, particularly if you have a resurrection orb or a reanimator on standby. Next up we've got the Shock Elite Destroyers, the Scorpex, £35, $60 or €45, Euros. 
typically costing around 130 points in game with their plasma sight, and are perhaps one of the best Necron melee units out there at the moment, absolutely rinsing things with a whole flurry of high strength multi damage attacks. Having one of these guys fighting against a Space Marine was perhaps one of the poster childs of all of 9th edition 40k. The tripod models really do look quite sinister, and I must admit those blades look very nice the way that they've painted them there. The kit is quite a simple one, no real options in terms of weapons or anything, a little bit monopose but still very nice looking. I'd bear in mind that these are available in all sorts of different places, they're in the Elite Starter Set at the moment, they came out in that Imperium magazine in various places around the world, and plus were in Indomitus. It means that you often might find squads of these going for cheaper on eBay, even completely new. In game they're pretty mighty, decent damage and defence profiles, okay movement, and a really nice stratagem for minus one to wound. Next we've got the Lich Guard kit, which also builds the Triarch Praetorians, £32.50, $55 or €42.50, kind of middling on the points per dollars ratio, although fairly strong in game, particularly with buffs from the Silent King. The Lich Guard are fairly bulky Necron elites, a level up again from the Immortals, they can either be armed with some brutal war size, or more commonly the sword and the shield, fairly tough to remove from the board with their two wounds. Otherwise, the different build option for the kit are the Triarch Praetorians, the sort of jump pack type Necrons, and the direct underlings of Zarek himself. They can either be armed with the Staffs of Light that you see here, which I think again look very nice with the nice green glowing effect, and they do have the option for a sword and pistol loadout too. Their whole jump pack type thing does look a little bit on the odd side maybe, with those sort of roll bar back things, though I suppose quite a few bits of Necron technology just don't really look like they'd work, presumably because they're just too advanced to see exactly what's going on. Next up we've got the Hexmark Destroyer, £21, $35 or €27. Euros. This guy was quite a cool new model for the new Necron release. It gets you a 65 point character in game, though it still isn't enormously strong for its cost in my opinion. There is something just very rule of cool about a gunslinger wielding 6 different pistols at once though, and he certainly can stack a fair amount of hurt onto hordes, or potentially even expose characters if he's lucky. He is pretty much a monopose model, though I must admit at that price it isn't terrible by Games Workshop standards, as a character, he's a little bit bigger than some at least. In-game, he can pop up, hopefully somewhere hidden well, and spam out a bunch of mid-strength AP-1 attacks. Against some factions, he genuinely will be quite good. Things like Orcs are quite good prey, but Armour of Contempt will make those AP-1 guns a bit sad. Let's talk Katarn next, with the Katarn Shard of the Void Dragon. £70, $115 or €90. Euros. One of the big centerpiece kits for Games Workshop's relaunch of the faction in 9th edition, and I think if you asked a lot of people what their favourite Necron model would be after the new release, quite a lot of people would go for this guy. The model has a real eldritch horror type vibe going on, there's cool details like a sort of pixelated chest like he's half loaded in and out of reality, those fixed metal wings crackling with energy holding him aloft, all the cool lightning and the little bits of terrain that are being borne aloft as he passes, and of course the disturbingly horrific face that he has, his face being replaced by a glowing rune and nothing more. In game it cost you 300 points, so it's a bit sort of mid-territory in terms of points per dollar, though in general Katarn are pretty usable in game, I think he competes well with his fellows. If you do happen to run into Imperial Knights or something, he's almost certainly going to be your best bet there. Otherwise I believe he has a couple of different face swap options if you do want a different appearance for him, though I must admit I think I will be a little bit cautious with this model, I think if there's ever a model in 40k that you don't want to drop on the floor sometime, then it's going to be this guy. I would not really like to be fixing that spindly lightning with plastic glue. Otherwise, for Katarn, we have the Shard of the Nightbringer. I think for arguably the mightiest Katarn and the Spectre of Death itself, he is going to be looking at the Void Dragon's new miniature with some envy, but it does come with some positives in that he is really quite cheap £27.50, $45, or €35. Euros. That gets you 320 points in game currently. So in terms of investing money to get points on the board, this guy's about one of the best buys that you can possibly make at the moment. It's also pretty terrifying game, cutting through invul saves and dealing out buckets of mortal wounds, all while having that necrodermis special rule to stop him taking too many wounds at once. Miniature-wise, the sculpt is a bit of a classic one. It does kind of feel like it's one of that generation of sculpts that Games Workshop will get round to replacing at some stage, though, with bigger, badder new forms like the Avatar of Kane got. It is a resin fine cast kit as well, which is a downside. His side can come out a bit warped and might need some readjustment with some heating. If you like the sculpt, though, or just want a really scary threat in game, this guy can be a very quick jump to get a lot more points into a Necron army without all that much investment. 
Lastly, with the Katan that you can get individually, we have the Katan Shard of the Deceiver, pretty much similar to the Nightbringer here. The sculpt is from the same time, he costs the same price, gets you a few less points in game, and he's going for a bit more of a Gilded Trickster kind of look, as opposed to the Nightbringer's Spectre of Doom and Death itself. It's perhaps not quite as overwhelming in game, in my opinion, perhaps the least played of the four Katan variants, the last one being the Transcendent Katan, which comes as an option in the Tesseract Vault kits. He doesn't have quite as much raw might, but he can give you some redeploy shenanigans, and I have seen competitive lists using him before. Moving on, we've got the Canoptic Spider, £26, $42, or €34, Euros, and 75 points in game if you do give it a bit of gear. You do get quite a fun medium-sized miniature for that piece, a small monster, though its current strength in combat isn't absolutely enormous, maybe a bit of a general purpose unit, can do a psychic denial, a bit of close range shooting, a bit of melee and resurrect scarabs, between the lot of that you might be able to get enough value out of it on the board. I do quite like the miniature itself though, I think the central power core thing it's got in the middle of the body looks really quite awesome, I don't think many people would like an enormous robot bog like that coming after them. Options wise you can get a fabricator claw and particle weapons on it, so you can certainly have a bit of flexibility. Lastly for the elite section we have the Triarch Stalker, £35, $60 or €45, Euros. Pretty much a day is for one of Zarek's higher representatives. From this little command walker, he can mark out targets to enemies and also blaze away with a Gauss cannon or one of the other guns. I think it can also be built with a particle shredder, sorry, not Tesla, and a heat ray. This one is another medium age Necron kit, came about around a decade ago, though I think it still holds up pretty nicely. I would say at the moment though that it isn't super strong for the points, a bit of a niche role within shooting Necron lists and pretty much nothing else. I think it will look quite cool though, marching to war alongside some Doomstalkers in a bit of a Necron Walker Brigade. Fast attack next, and now we come to the Tomb Blades. For three of them it's £32.50, $55 or €42.50, Euros 50, costing around 75 points in game, maybe a little bit less if you leave off the gear. Either way, they really aren't that great in terms of points for the model. I guess if you did want to economise and acquire them a little bit cheaper, they do come in the Combat Patrol, so there might be an option or possibly for people reselling them online who got that box. I must admit, I do feel that these things do look a little bit on the ungainly side. Again, with Necron technology, I believe the idea is that you have advanced anti-grav things keeping them aloft that perhaps don't really look like standard engines, and they don't really need to be particularly aerodynamic as a result either. Weapons-wise, they've got a few options that you can see each of here, either particle weapons, Tesla carbines mounted either side, or twin gauss blasters. Plus you have some different options for the side fins and things, whether or not you want shield veins. In the kits, basically all the three models are the same here. They all come with all the options, so you can equip them how you like. They also have the flight stand and fairly small flying bases on them as well. Maybe a model that's just a little bit more likely to tip over than some. In game, following a big points drop, I think they're actually fairly good at the moment. A fast unit that can jump out to objectives and be fairly expendable, and I've even seen a few people using them as big damage. They can get quite a lot of gas or tesla fire where they need to at short notice. Next up we've got the Ophidian Destroyers, £35, $60 or €45, Euros. maybe not super strong on the points per dollar side of things, but these guys I think have very nice models indeed, and I think were generally well received by Necron players when they saw them. Though this incarnation is very much a variant on Destroyer, the models themselves are very similar indeed to the previous edition's Necron Wraiths, the old metal models with the taloned fingers that were replaced by the models that we'll get onto. The kit again, like the Scorpet Destroyers, is a kind of simple one, no major options on them. I guess the main choice is whether or not you bring along their plasma site friend for a little bit of extra melee damage. Still though, loads of motion in the models, they look very sinister. In game they're perhaps a little bit on the fragile side, but can still be okay as a utility unit, and can be genuinely quite threatening in melee with the plasma site, and potentially in Novok perhaps. Otherwise, we've got the Canoptic Wraiths themselves, the same price for another flavour of serpentine Necron melee monsters, coiled Canoptic constructs that hunt down any interlopers in the tomb worlds. I do quite like how a lot of the Canoptic units look halfway between machine constructs and perhaps either a friendly or not so friendly animal, depending on whose side you're on. Most people seem to prefer running them just with the standard claws that you can see here, though they do have the options, though they do have the options for some whips and some close range particle weapons too. The sprues on the raves are fairly similar, they mainly vary just by the different tails that you get on them for some slight variations in pose. In game I think they're fairly solid, pretty durable, fast moving, and have enough melee threats to chip at least a little bit of wounds off most targets. 
While we're on the subject of buying model kits, I would just like to quickly mention one way in which you can get Warhammer a bit cheaper if you happen to live in the UK. Third party retailers are usually a great shout, I've got a link down to Element Games in the video description, usually somewhere between 10 and 20% off Games Workshop's miniatures, and that can add up to quite a bit over the course of buying an army. If you live in the UK, it can be quite a decent saving, so feel free to check them out down in the link below. The link is an affiliate link, so it does help out the channel a little bit as well, but clicking through it doesn't make it cost any more for you whatsoever, so it can just be one way to help save money on some models. Heavy support next, and we've got the bigger batter arcs available. £35, $60 or €45 Euros would get you a Ghost Arc or Doomsday Arc, kind of middling in terms of points per dollar value, obviously a bit more if you give it the massive gun. I think the Ghost Arc does have a pretty cool feel to it, has a bit of a feel of a Necron Ghost Ship where you can see the individual warriors in stasis until they're activated, though with all those rib sections and all the Necron warriors wind up, it does mean that it's a pretty annoying model to build and paint, kind of famously so within Warhammer 40k. It does take a lot of effort to get one of these looking good, there's just so many surfaces to try and paint here. The arc's mounted on a flying base underneath it, and this one's the Doomsday Arc, the alternate version where you basically turn the ribbed bits upside down and fit that enormous Doomsday Cannon underneath it. In game, the standard arc really isn't too bad for ferrying warriors towards the front, I think the Doomsday Arc is maybe just a little bit more on the niche side. The firepower isn't terrible, and the Gauss flares are quite nice to back it up, but it is a little bit depressingly static, and loses a fair bit of its damage output when it moves. Next we've got the Locust Heavy Destroyer, another rather recent entry at £21, $35 or €27 Euros for one model. In game he is quite cheap at 50 points, they're really quite powerful for that. I do like the great big gas weapon that he gets for the 3d3 damage when it gets a wound through. The gun that he has is pretty ridiculously hefty, as well as the Gauss option, he's also got the choice of an Enmitic Exterminator for a little bit of anti-infantry, and it is kind of interesting to see a new take on the standard destroyers, a bit more of a curved body with those massive engines underneath it. The kit's quite a good quality one from their recent range, if fairly simple, fairly efficient in game at the moment, though not all that great in terms of getting points on the board per dollar investors. Otherwise, we've got the standard versions in the Locust Destroyer, with these guys, you weirdly have two different options, either the choice to get just one or a squad of three of them, a squad of three of them costing the same as two of them bought individually. This guy is one of the last relics of the Necrons with the green glowing gauss rods, an old kit that I would expect to be right in the firing line for replacing whenever Necrons get another release. It seems kind of inevitable that they're going to do some smaller ones in the same style as the bigger Locust Heavy Destroyer. It's kind of a question as to when they get round of it as opposed to if. With Games Workshop's releases though, for all we know it could be years away. A little bit annoying for if you did want to get some of the standard ones for playing in-game. Miniature-wise, it is fairly simple by modern standards. The green gauss rods aim to be played unpainted, but you could potentially paint over them if you wanted. A fairly classic 40k silhouette, but definitely an era from a slightly more simple time in terms of model making. If you were getting multiple, it would probably make sense to get the Locust Destroyer Squadron, as it's basically the same cost as two of the standard ones, but you get three. Currently these guys are seeing a fair amount of play in game. They do do quite well with Zarek's rerolls, and they're quite efficient mobile shooting for the points at only 40, and have access to their full reroll stratagem, which is quite nice with those general purpose Gauss cannons. The Canoptet Doomstalker is another recent entry into the heavy support. £27.50, $45 or €35, Euros, typically costing around 130 points in game. Not terrible in terms of points per dollar as Necrons go. It looks quite similar to the Reanimator, but is quite a lot of a bigger kit. It's quite fun that this thing's fairly tall. Quite a few Necron players seem to fairly affectionately refer to them as War of the Worlds walkers, definitely otherworldly aliens that are blasting enemies to death with unknowable technology from a long distance. Again, like the Locust Heavy Destroyer, it's a fairly simplistic kit without any real options, but looks quite good regardless, I think. At the moment, it's not dreadful for the firepower, though just seems rather inferior to the Doomsday Arc for the same role. For the extra 30 points, getting a massive amount more defence, plus better accuracy, and all the players, seems like it's easily worth it. Flyers next, and in the core codex, the Necrons have the Night Scythe, and its alternate build, the Doom Scythe. £40, $65, or €55 Euros for everyone's favourite flying croissants, sort of middling both in terms of in-game strength and how many points you get for the investment. I think the Crescent Fly design is really quite simple and effective. Again, I think it has some cool alien invasion style vibes, 
pretty much a saucer that can beam down Necrons onto the surface of a planet, and I think it's kind of fun that the pilot's basically open to the elements, not sure if it's protected by a force field of some sort, but I guess they don't exactly need to breathe air anyway. The standard Knight side is just armed with the Tesla Destructors for a fair bit of anti-infantry firepower, though this Doom side basically just bolts on a Death Ray for a fairly punishing anti-tank shot, I think the points cut and making them core have made them a bit more viable for that role. Otherwise, the night side I think works okay if you're mainly using it for the stratagem, basically allowing you to deliver a close Necron Assault turn 2 if you need to, though it does cost a CP or 2 to go down that strategy. Again, I would bear in mind that the Knight and the Doom side both come in the Combat Patrol kit, so if you're getting one of these anyway, you do basically have the option to get the Tomb Blades, Immortals and Overlord at a fairly decent discount price. Lords of War next, and first up we have the Resculpt of the Monolith, £105, $170 or €140, Euros, a fairly chunky and really quite pricey kit, always a bit disturbing when you have them cracking £100. In game following some points decreases, this one's dropped down to 320 makes it kind of middling to poor on the points per dollar front, though at least with the points decrease and gaining core, it's got to be a little bit more of an interesting in-game choice, even if perhaps not a lot of people have room for one in a list once they're including things like the Silent King or Catan. In general, I think this new sculpt for the monolith was very well received indeed, a reimagination of the big Necron miniature with a glowing crystal in it, though in the codex it was removed from the heavy support slots to the super heavy one, which hasn't helped it too much. I think the new sculpt is really quite a cool one though, it very much feels halfway between a building and a war machine, a huge glowing energy source at the top to spurt out some particle whip attacks, a fun option for the portal where you have the choice of having a Necron warrior half phased in through it to look like they're advancing out of the monolith itself, and in terms of options they now have the choice between Gauss Flux Arcs on the side or these little death rays as well, they potentially do put out a fair amount of anti-tank fire up close. Another pretty cool centerpiece kit, Necrons don't really seem to be lacking too much for those. Speaking of which, we also have the Tesseract Vault and its alternate build in the Obelisk and the Transcendent Catan. Interestingly, despite being perhaps a slightly bigger Lord of War, because they're a model that came out quite a long time ago, they cost a little bit less than the monolith, £100, $170 or €130. Euros. The Vault's the one that's built open, with the various sections set back a bit, and the great big days for the Transcendent Catan in the middle, no doubt belting out unnatural energies to blast the foes of the Necrons into bits. The Tesseract Vault is a bit of a massive kit, and it's also posed slightly strangely high up on the flight stand as well. In general, if a Games Workshop's models, I'd say it's perhaps one of the harder ones to transport around, and remains pretty top-heavy when you get it on a table. The big armour plate things aren't really attached by all that much to the central bit of it, I remember it being quite a comical sight when quite a lot of people were struggling to get them on a table when they suddenly got really good in 8th edition. I think you perhaps had to be pretty dedicated to tournaments to go out of your way to find three of these things. Otherwise, the alternate build is the Obelisk and Transcendent Catan. The Obelisk, again, does feel kind of halfway between building and war machine, though sadly at the moment it's perhaps one of the worst Necrons units around, just doing a little bit of damage with those Tesla arcs and being rather tough. If you do count the Transcendent Catan though, at least it gives you a fair amount of points per the money invested I guess. In theory this is the only way that you can get a Transcendent Catan in the Necron army, though Catan being what they are and varying from one form to another, it does seem like a pretty easy model that you could convert out of just about whatever you wanted to, provided it had some eldritch horror and Necron vibes. We've got the Necron Fortification next in the Convergence of Dominion, £37.50, $60 or €50. Euros for three mini obelisk-like fortifications. I do quite like the way that they have various amounts of rubble and stone attached to them, and some of them appear to be more awakened to reveal the technology within. In-game it's quite cheap for the three of them at 100 points, though I must admit their in-game strength is pretty bad. They're tough to take out, but just don't really do a lot. They give out a little morale boost and have a slightly weak close-range attack. I think if you did want these, I'd be more tempted just to run them as cool terrain pieces as opposed to their actual in-game rules. It's kind of fun to have some Necron specific terrain available from Games Workshop in any case though. Moving on to characters next, and we'll start off with the Silent King, who I guess should be in the Lord of War slot really. Zarek himself was perhaps the crowning centerpiece of the Necron 9th edition relaunch. £95, $160 or €125, Euros. that nets you 400 points in game, and isn't terrible on the points per dollar front just because of how much stuff he does. 
I think he's been really quite a popular pickup for Necron collectors, a very cool miniature indeed, a great big hover throne powered by an entire shard of a guitar in itself in the back of it, the three members of the Triarch hovering forwards to doll out judgement to their foes, flanked by two Meneers hovering on beams of energy, and the great big robed form of Zarek himself with a pretty enormous metal Necron body towering over even overlords. In terms of people picking him up, I guess it doesn't hurt that he's also very very strong in game at the moment as well, pretty much auto include in Necron lists at the moment. His buffs and damage output are pretty outstanding, getting extra command points in Nephilim is a must, he chips in with a fair amount of scary firepower and then has a lot of melee attacks that make the enemy fight last, really quite a cool centerpiece to the range. I think a fair few people have painted a copy of him up and were looking for an excuse to put him on the table. Moving on to other characters, and perhaps the other biggest kit is the Catacomb Command Barge, which can also be built as the Annihilation Barge. £32.50, $55 or €42.50, the Catacomb Command Barge will typically cost around about 175 points, not too bad on the points per dollar front there, and it basically gives you a mini chariot sort of affair with the Overlord rising on the back, with a couple of attendants piloting the thing, and some big firepower slung underneath. It can also be built as the Annihilation Barge as well, swap out the Overlord, and you can build the Overlord on foot if you want to, and replace him with an absolutely enormous Tesla cannon, which I must admit looks a little bit more potent than it really feels in game, with its damage only being one per shot. I think the model looks like quite a cool one, no matter which way you build it to be honest. The Catacomb Command Barge is quite a popular choice to get an Overlord about a bit quicker, and get the buffs where they need to be, though the Annihilation Barge I think is still usable, particularly in Mephrid, and particularly with certain firepower buffs, it does quite like the Silent King's re-rolls with those exploding sixes. Otherwise for Necron HQs, there's a fair few options with Overlords, one generic one, then a bunch of special characters. Due to their range rotation, I believe that they've taken down the standard Necron Lord, and they no longer sell the bits for the Locust Lord either. If you wanted those, you just have to convert them with some bits, either from a Catacomb Command Barge, a standard Overlord, or maybe something like Lich Guard. The standard Overlord, I think, is quite a cool miniature, armed with a great big scythe and resurrection orb, quite a cool generic leader, and you do have the alternate option of the Overlord sculpt that comes in the Elite box set. A pretty solid enough leader for the faction, quite nice that he came down in points, and I think he is an alternative for the Catacomb Command Barge. He is also viable on foot. Otherwise, we've got Nemesaur Zandrek and Vargard Oberon, a pair of Sotek characters that I guess you could use for alternate Lord or Overlord sculpts if you wanted. They're a bit cheaper than the plastic version. I would bear in mind that these ones are resin miniatures though, not the biggest advantage when it comes from Games Workshop. Neither of them I'd rate as super strong in game at the moment. Otherwise, there's a pretty decent cast of other character Overlords, perhaps a bit more generous in terms of special character sculpts compared with a few of the other Xenos factions. And again, all of these are a little bit cheaper than the standard Overlord, but also cast in resin. Amrakir the Traveller can be used in multiple dynasties. It's actually quite nice to use with melee Necrons, as he can give plus one attack out to them. It works fairly nicely with things like Flayed Ones or Scorpet Destroyers. Trazen the Infinite is a pretty big character in the lore, famous for stealing people and things to add to his collection across the galaxy. Creed being one of his latest victims, maybe not super standout in game, though he is cheaper than most. Imitet the Stormlord is the head of the Sotek dynasty, I think for his points he really brings quite a lot for what he costs. Quite a cool model that you can certainly imagine him calling down the storm on his enemy with. Just a bit of a shame that the Sotek dynasty is so underwhelming based on the core benefits that it gives you. Then we've got Cryptex. Again another range rotation one was the more standard Cryptek on foot. Currently the three standalone options are the Canoptek Cloak one, the Chronomancer and the Psychomancer. The Plasmancer comes as part of the weird combination box sets. All pretty cool little dynastic advisor miniatures in their own way. I think the Chronomancer and the Psychomancer are both really interesting models. The Chronomancer with a sort of planetary staff and various cubes and tentacle things going on. And I think the Psychomancer's digital skull effect is a really interesting model design. Definitely looks like a fun miniature to paint up. Weirdly, all these little advisors cost a little bit more than the Overlords. Interestingly, the Chronomancer costs more than any of them. Not really too sure how to account for that discrepancy other than just Games Workshop being weird. There's a couple of character cryptex as well, the first one being the fairly recent sculpt of Illuminor Seraz, who is a pretty big miniature as it goes. Even for a fairly big character miniature though, £32, $55 or €42.50 is rather expensive for a Games Workshop character miniature. 
in game at the moment. He's particularly interesting with that very weird interaction of being able to resurrect one of Zarek's menhirs, as well as do a bit of augmenting goodness on any core units, which is now the vast majority of the Necron Codex. His miniature is a pretty super disturbing one as well. He's basically harvesting a slain Imperial citizen there. He casually seems to be absorbing his soul or something into his gauntlet. I'm sure it's all justified in the purpose of science. Otherwise, Orokin the Diviner is an older resin miniature. Personally, I think he is the least interesting looking out of the various cryptex, maybe showing his age just a little bit compared with the other newer plastics. Moving on from characters next, and we have the big Necron combined bundles. First up, we've got the faction's most clear and obvious value box set, Combat Patrol Necrons, for £90, $150 or €120. Euros. This one gets you around about 500 points of models, depending on exactly what loadouts you give some of the units. Fairly good on the points per dollar ratio, though interestingly still not quite as good as the standard Necron Warrior kit. Of course its value to you might vary a bit, depending on how much you actually wanted the individual models on offer, as you do get all of them. Including in the kit is that same Overlord sculpt that we saw before, the Tomb Blades, a Night Scythe or Doom Scythe, and then 10 Necron Immortal or Death Marks, depending on how you choose to build them. Compared with the value of the kits individually, it nets you around about a 38% discount. That's a pretty good number from Games Workshop as combat patrols go. Typically they vary somewhere between the 25 and 45 mark, so 38 is towards the upper end of that. I think the unit mix for a new player is a pretty decent one. A couple of troops choices if you want them, pretty much the core HQ of the faction, plus the fast attack and a relatively hard hitting flyer. I think if I was starting Necrons, I would certainly pick up one copy of this. There might be some slightly diminishing returns to getting two of them, I suppose. You will be getting quite a lot of Immortal slash Death Marks, plus two copies of the same Overlord. Otherwise, and a rather peculiar Necron bundle is the Necrons Royal Court set. This one's two character miniatures, one small vehicle, and two elite attendant models, all packaged together on the same sprue for £70, $115 or €90. Euros and they're basically all packaged together because they share sprues in the Indomitus set, so Games Workshop would have to make entirely new moulds for them if they were to be sold separately. The box set is a direct-only one as well, I believe, which means that you're not typically going to be able to get it at good discounts from third-party retailers. The models that you get are the Plasmancer Cryptek for firing out some mortal wounds, the big and bad Scorpec Lord, who was seen in the launch trailer for 9th edition, the two fun Murder Bucket Cryptothrowls with their big claws, and a fairly placid and friendly looking Canoptic Reanimator, probably a great guy in the Tomb Worlds once you get to know him. I think all the models are pretty cool ones in their own way, quite a fun little random reinforcement package for an army, and they aren't even terrible in terms of points per dollar, mainly owing to having characters which inflates the value quite a bit. The combo is just a bit weird though, the three main elements of the box just really don't have all that much synergy with each other whatsoever, so maybe it might be a good reinforcement to a Necron collection later down the line, as opposed to something to start with. While Indomitus is still in recent history, you might well be able to get these online for a fair bit cheaper than Games Workshop would sell them. The box did sell a crazy amount of copies, and a lot of people will have been selling the contents of it over the years. For in-game value, I'd say they're a bit of a mixed bag. The Plasmancer is kind of bad for the cost in my opinion. The Scorpet Lord perhaps a bit so-so. Not bad, but not terrible either. Can pack a punch. The Reanimator can actually be quite decent with Necron Warriors or Flayed ones, provided you can hide it. And the Crypto Throws are a pretty interesting little chaff unit, can stand on objectives and do things for only 40 points for a small model unit, and can actually be okay melee when they are next to a Cryptek. Otherwise, for bundled box sets, I think it's worth mentioning the starter sets for 40k. Recruit Edition at £32.50, $50 or €40. Euros. On the Necron front, it gets you the 10 Warriors, 3 Scarabs and 1 Royal Warden, plus a Space Marine Lieutenant and some Assault Intercessors. As mentioned before, if you're going to get a Necron Warrior box set, you might as well get this. So much more stuff just for a pound or two. Can give you a few fun Space Marines to paint up, or potentially even better value if you split it with a friend. If you did want all the miniatures within it, it's perhaps one of the single best deals in all of Games Workshop's 40k at the moment. 8.6 points per dollar is better than just about anything else. It is the only place to get the Royal Warden, though he is a little bit on the niche side in game in my opinion. And as box sets go, it's a pretty good place to start Necrons, or just Warhammer 40k in general. Otherwise, we've got the bigger brother of the set, the 40k Elite Edition. This one's basically double the price of Recruit. Swaps out the Warden for a different sculpt of Overlord, and adds in a set of the Fighty Scorpec Destroyers. All of that faces off against the Space Marine Force, reinforced by three Outriders, and swapping the Lieutenant for a Captain. 
Maybe not quite as much crazy value in terms of points per the dollar as Recruit, but not all that far off either. Again, another very solid one to split with friends, or potentially even sell off the Space Marines if you didn't want them, and it is the only place to get this Overlord sculpt besides eBay. I'd also bear in mind that the Command Edition exists as well, for newer players who want some extra terrain and the rulebook too, that could well be worth it as an upgrade over this. Finally, we'll just take a quick look at the Necron Forge World units. These aren't in the Codex, but their rules can be found in the Imperial Armor Compendium. Most of them are models that go back at least a fair way. I think the newest is that Seraptic Heavy Construct. Being Forge World pieces, they're slightly more advanced kits cast in resin. They might often need a little bit more work and clean up than standard Games Workshop plastics, and Forge World prices do put Games Workshops to shame often being a solid 50% more expensive than what Games Workshop might sell a kit for, which is often a fair bit to begin with. First up, there's the Tesseract Arc, a pretty fun little single Necron vehicle packing a bunch of fun guns. Quite a cool curved design on this one, and I think it looks fairly nice and aesthetic. Not enormously strong in game, though I must admit the vast majority of Necron Forge World stuff isn't standout. The Night Shroud boasts an enclosed cockpit, a massive great big extension fin, and drops bombs on enemies. It's basically a night scythe or doom scythe, but bigger. The Necron Sentry Pylon really is a pretty massive kit, and comes with a price tag to boot, almost £130, or around $200. This thing is a pretty massive Necron terrain piece though, which can fire out a pretty devastating shooting attack. Quite a bit of anti-tank, though still probably not really worth it for 450 points. A bit of a classic terrain piece that you might often see behind Necrons in art or the lore though. Otherwise, there's a few Canoptic Constructs, the centipede light legs of the Tomb Sentinel. It does seem that Necrons have reimagined all sorts of different bugs in Canoptic form. Weird hovering Canoptic Acanthrites that look kind of akin to robot wasps with a barbed tail. Pretty fun miniatures to have buzzing around the battlefield. And there's a baby version of the Gauss Pylon as well in the Sentry Pylon. A bit more pint sized and only around 100 to 125 points rather than 450. Perhaps not too dissimilar from the Tomb Sentinel, there's also the Tomb Stalker, scurrying around on too many legs with a couple of guns this one. And then perhaps the biggest and most well known of the Necron Forge World things, the Seraptic Heavy Construct. In the lore this thing's one of the ultimate guardians of the Tomb Worlds, rarely brought out to play by its overlord except in dire circumstances. In game it's a cool 600 points, fairly threatening, though again maybe a little bit questionable for quite that much. From Forge World it's £200 or $300. So annoyingly you have to buy the guns separately for a bit more. I think strangely for some reason it's only got the one gun option on offer at the moment, the other ones went out of production. Really quite a fun heavy fighting bug though, strikes quite an imposing sight on the battlefield, being a similar sort of size to a knight. So with Forge World done that just about rounds up our tour of the Necron units of 40k. Hope you've enjoyed a bit of a tour through the range, and as always let me know any thoughts, insights or experience that you have with the kits. Any comments like that will be greatly appreciated to help out new players. Hopefully I'll be aiming to get out a few more model kit reviews for other factions in 40k, so feel free to subscribe to Auspex Tactics if you'd like to see that. I'm sure I'll have plenty more stuff for the Necrons too as we go along. Finally, if you've enjoyed the video and you'd like to help support, I would just like to mention that Auspex Tactics does have a Patreon page, and you can find that link down in the video description below. If you have been finding the videos on the channel useful, then feel free to check it out. It is what allows me to keep on making long-form videos like this quite so regularly. Channel patrons do get a fair few advantages, seeing certain videos early, regular votes to see what sort of things come next on the channel, and automatic entry into the regular prize giveaways, with a chance to win some big model kits each month. If any of that sounds good to you, or you'd just like to help support, the link is down in the video description. In any case, a massive thank you for listening, and I'll hope to see you guys next time.